Today, we will be discussing common drug-induced sexual dysfunction in men. I have no disclosures. So we will be discussing two very common, um, yet very poorly understood um, sexual dysfunction, um, post-finasteride syndrome and then post-SSRI sexual dysfunction. So post-finasteride syndrome. So post-finasteride syndrome is kind of a controversial um, uh, diagnosis in the world of urology, but even though we find it controversial, our patients do not. Patients that are suffering from this condition, you know, don't necessarily want to wade into the weeds of, is it real, is it not? Because they are really experiencing symptoms. Within the world of sexual medicine, we have more so, um, you know, opened our minds to the idea that, um, you know, post finasteride syndrome does exist. So PFS is defined as persistent or irreversible adverse event effects that happen to continue after discontinuation of the drug finasteride. Um, symptoms can include persistent erectile dysfunction, loss of libido, decreased volume of ejaculate, penile shrinkage, cognitive impairment, and then also psychiatric symptoms like depression, suicidality, anxiety. And oftentimes these psychiatric symptoms are made worse by um, kind of the dismissal of patients by the medical community that do associate their symptoms with their use of finasteride. So, you know, when looking at the incidence of finasteride, it's largely unknown. Um, and that is because for several reasons. So many people that we prescribe finasteride to are, you know, over the age of um, 50 or 60. Um, we, they tend to be an aging population which who will already have some degree of sexual dysfunction at baseline. So it's hard to know whether or not their sexual degree, degree of sexual dysfunction is because of the drug itself versus age. A really important demographic to look at is the uh, post-finasteride syndrome in our treatment for uh, male pattern, pattern baldness. Um, there are a couple case series coming out um, looking at the incidence of PFS in um, younger patients that were treated um, with finasteride for um, uh, male pattern baldness or alopecia. Um, and so that's, I think, the best research group to actually see what the effects are of, um, of post-finasteride syndrome. Um, so when we look at the actual medication, um, there are clinical trials that do support the sexual side effects of um, uh, uh, finasteride and dutasteride um, are low and reversible, but there, um, in there are there is a in 2012 the FDA actually made changes to the inserts um, to con to include the persistence of side effects, um, and so that is. That tells us that, you know, there, the possibility of when we tell patients that, oh, the symptoms should go away when they're, when the medication stops is, may not be correct. Um, and in 2015, PFS was included in the list of rare and genetic diseases by the NIH. So it is something that is becoming and gaining more traction. Um, so post-finasteride syndrome is caused by 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, which are a class of anti-androgenic drugs. Um, they're oftentimes used for BPH and, or androgenic alopecia. Um, the most commonly used types are dutasteride and finasteride. Um, and clinical practice with things like minoxidil, saw palmetto, um, also have anti-androgen effects associated with them. The mechanism of action um, for 5-alpha reductase inhibitors is that they inhibit the 5-alpha reductase enzyme, um, which is responsible for the conversion of testosterone to its active derivative, DHT. 5-alpha um, uh, reductase um, uh, ultimately affect your body's ability to utilize testosterone um, and or affects your body's ability to utilize DHT, which is the most potent type of testosterone. And we know that there, this actually does have long-term um, sequela to the muscle of smooth muscle of the penis, as well as there are also um, receptors, neuroreceptors, neurotransmitter receptors, um, of testosterone on the brain. And so further research is needed to show, you know, if we're, if there are receptors present um, and those receptors are associated with mood um, and um, 
uh, with mood and we're blocking those receptors or well, essentially not able to let those receptors um, work effectively, you know, it's not uncommon or it's not out of the realm of possibility that these patients can actually have um, psychiatric symptoms outside of uh, outside of the secondary psychiatric symptoms uh, caused by the condition itself. Um, animal models have actually shown that androgen deprivation um, can cause penile tissue atrophy, um, autonomic and sensory nerve alterations, endothelial changes, um, as well as increased deposition of fat uh, into the muscle. So again, there are actual real um, physiologic changes that happen with the blocking of testosterone. So, you know, really the big thing is I, I always tell people um, is just validating your patient's concerns because this is something that is real <laughs> and something um, that is backed by science. And although we don't have really great treatment modalities at this point in time, we're, we do have to start validating our patients and, and you know letting them know that we are working towards um, treatment and working towards getting a better understanding of who develops PFS. So, as of right now, there's no solid treatment algorithm for um, PFS. Um, typically, uh, the biopsychosocial model works for all sexual dysfunction. Um, and so stopping the medication um, is, and stopping and keeping off the medication is important. Patient education is also very important. Oftentimes these patients are actually over-educated because they are so dismissed by the medical community. Um, uh, and then just kind of going from a stepwise process of treatment of each of their symptoms. So treatment of their ED, whether that is with um, oral medications, injections, whether it's with, um, and even a penile implant, um, treatment of the libido. So oftentimes they have uh, low libido, um, uh, and that could either be um, physiologic versus psychologic, but at least addressing that, whether it was with a sex therapist or assessing other, working them up for other causes of low libido, um, oftentimes testosterone supplementation um, and mental health work. So the next thing we're gonna talk about is post-selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor sexual dysfunction, um, or PSSD. So PSSD is defined as continued sexual side effects six months after discontinuation of SSRIs. Um, common side effects of, or common symptoms of PSSD include genital anesthesia, um, anhedonia, decreased sex drive, erectile dysfunction, premature ejaculation, and um, and for um, women, poor vaginal lubrication and um, for all nipple insensitivity. Um, so what are SSRIs? SSRIs are widely used class of drugs. Um, they're frequently the first line treatment for depression um, and other numerous uh, psychiatric disorders. Um, the most common uh, SSRIs um, are paroxetine, sertraline, fluoxetine, um, and citalopram. Um, common side effects of SSRIs are GI distress, um, insomnia, um, uh, um, anorexia, and then also low libido, delayed ejaculation, uh, and erectile dysfunction. Actually, SSRIs are oftentimes used for the treatment of premature ejaculation. So we can obviously see that the in that one it's used as treatment, but when you're using it. Um, to treat other things, it's very common to get the side effect of delayed ejaculation. Um, so what is the mechanism of action? Um, SSRIs essentially prevent the reuptake of serotonin, thus increasing uh, serotonin activity. Um, the role of serotonin, it is great for your mood, but it is an absolute dare I say, boner killer. Um, serotonin actually has negative effects in sexual desire and sexual drive and sexual respons responsivity. Um, the pathophysiology of uh, PSSD is to why people have persistent um, uh, sexual side effects when they've stopped the medication um, is 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 um, is still widely debated. But these are um, uh, essentially the 
proposed causes. So the increase in serotonin, which then reciprocally decreases dopamine, which is pro-sex neurotransmitter. Um, there's also decreased amount of oxytocin um, and decreased testosterone levels um, in these patients. Um, because of that, uh, it also um, has been shown, SSRIs have been shown to inhibit nitric oxide release. And we know that nitric oxide is directly related to erectile, um, erectile function. Um, and then a stimulation of alpha-1 adrenergic receptors, which is, again, pro or, or anti-erection. Um, so diagnosis for these patients, again, is a lot of validation, um, is obtaining history, medication history, um, looking at their labs, and then also a physical exam. Um, at this time, for both of these conditions, there's no set guidelines um, for, for these patients. Um, and so... Again, taking a biopsychosocial approach um, is key, and then trying to correct all the correctable factors. So if patients are coming in with uh, PSSD and erectile dysfunction, addressing the erectile dysfunction, because we know we have solid treatment mod modalities for that. If they come in with low libido, addressing the low libido, in the set, especially in the setting of hypogonadism, and correcting and, and, and getting them to uh, uh, normal levels um, there are also um, uh, medications that are on the market for um, low libido. These medications, though, are FDA approved for women. There's not been an FDA approved medication for men. So these are these are medications that you can use, but just counseling patients that this is something that you would use off label. Um, there has been treatment success noted with these medications, but there's not been any clinical trials, wide stage clinical trials, or wide stage case series. Um, and then, uh, as always, mental health assessment. Your brain is your biggest sex organ. If you are mentally um, in a state where you're not able to have a healthy sexual health life, there's no way that that psychological response will then transmit to a um, physiologic response. Um, so for both of these conditions, really, it's just validating our patients um, and then doing a very stepwise systemic or stepwise um, algorithm of addressing all the particular issues um, that they have. Um, further treatment or further research is needed um, for our patients in, in developing an algorithm, um, in developing a treatment modality for them that's going to be um, very effective. So, um, you know, I would love and encourage everyone to get involved in um, our research um, that we're doing through the uh, Society of Sexual Medicine. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to call me, or sorry, email me at emuloco at health.ucsd.edu.